You've selected a show from the Podcast Jukebox, a DIY podcast network. It's Will Sean Podcast. The internet cried out for two more blowhards, and they courageously answered that call. Armed with the weapon of wit, each week they're joined by guests to discuss movies, television, pop culture, and anything else that's pissing them off. Take it away, boys. I'm Will Link. And I'm Sean David. And this is Will Sean Podcast. No, it's the World Series. The Dodgers are literally playing right now. Ugh. How you doing, Will? Uh, well, see, it's it's better, though, that we're doing this during a game two, then, and not game seven. It's true, because we wouldn't be doing a game seven, because it's not going to go to seven. I've lost most... This is going to be a topic next week, but I've <laughs> lost most interest in this World Series once the Yankees were out of it. Yeah. Um, but you ask me how I'm doing. Yeah. So I figured I'd I always give, ask you how you do. I figured yes, I figured I'd give you an update based on uh, an enemy of the podcast from a couple weeks ago okay. of a uh, Tinder. How'd I'm, that go? I'm on. It, you know what? Yeah. Ever since I talked about how shitty Tinder was, I'm matching with people left and right. Look at that! It's great. I'm going out on all these terrible dates that go nowhere. I'm going out on a second date. Though. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't have high hopes. Oh, looks good. That's the, the attitude you want to go in with. The first date ended, uh-huh. and I said, and the, the girl was like, she grilled me. She was like, why are you in a relationship? What are you doing on Twitter? And I'm like, uh, like, <laughs> why are you in a relationship? And she's like, I just moved to town. And I'm like, okay. And uh, then I went, uh, I was standing on, like, the curb, not talking to her. She called an Uber for herself. Yeah. And I'm like, well, this date didn't go well. And the next day she texts me like, I had a great time. I'd love to do that again. <laughs> so I'm going out with her again. And someone pointed out to me, because they said, did you have a good time? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and they said, you know, you don't have to go out with her again. I said, yes, I do. I said, I have to, because I have to now see how this plays out. If I thought it was bad and then she thought it was good, I have to see, like, I have to know what's going well, on. Well, like you said, head. you're already going in with the right attitude on the second date. Yeah, it'll be good. Oh, yeah. Um, what's going on in the world of Will Sean Podcast? I want to continue to thank any listeners that we may have from the Podcast Jukebox Network. And uh, for any of our listeners, please make sure you check out some of the other shows on the Podcast Network, like Off the Cuffs or Drinks with God, which I assume is about people sitting and drinking, if not with God, then maybe discussing God while intoxicated. Yeah, we're on that network. We should have probably listened to that show. We have, man. You listen so many times, Will. You know what? <laughs> we were just talking about future guests we should get someone else from the podcast network on well maybe we'll cut all this out later but still, <laughs> i would like to thank anyone uh and if you haven't yet already please make sure you subscribe to us on itunes give us a five-star rating leave us a comment with the new podcast app uh despite how shitty and awful it is it's it makes it much easier for you to rate things within the app so go ahead and do that people um and just a couple of plugs for some past guests we yeah. still got game of thrones the musical right yes uh-huh. which i think had to rename itself to shame of thrones the really? unauthorized, you know, fan musical, but they will be extending their run in New York City. I saw that today. That's former guest Stephen Brandon's Stephen Brandon. uh, brainchild. And if you haven't already, please go see The Florida Project. Um, former guest Chris Burgock co-wrote uh, and produced the movie, and it's amazing. It's and we're going to get movie. him back on to talk about that as soon as he's done with his whole festival circuit, which yeah. will probably be... And being a big sometime, shot. Probably be sometime after the Oscars. Yeah, then maybe a while. That's right, yeah. Um, and who's our sponsor this week? A1 Parking Garage, where the gate is always open, the lights on, and an attendant on hand to help you retrieve your car no matter what time of day or night. Oh, I know why that's the... Yeah, we had a Somebody little... got their car locked in a parking garage. We nearly had an after-hours type situation. Yeah, I, w- I thought I was going to have to just drive you home. <sighs> and then you would have to I would have back nah, to downtown. Are you kidding me? I would have slept on the corner of Broadway and 6th. <laughs> With that... Shoeless, creepy guy, and the other. Very upset that we didn't have cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, On a show today, Netflix plans to make eighty original films. That's fucking crazy. We will discuss. Uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is being banned in a school in Mississippi. That's fucking crazy. (laughs) We will discuss. And Jimmy Fallon doesn't want to get political. I got some political words. For this son of a bitch. For James. Yeah, for James Fallon. Uh, But first, we are very excited to have with us today, Julie Pearson. Hello. Hello. 
Thank you for coming. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, um, Julie, I met you at a, um, I was about to say a storytelling show, but really it was the junk show, which is more of a variety show. Yeah, yeah it's I would say. like pretty. Oh, David Hunsberg. Big variety, yeah. 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 And um, uh, you had read a piece there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which then uh, caused me to look up other stuff you had read on the internet. I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to have you on. But before we get into all that stuff, uh, I always like to get the guest backstory. What is uh, their origin story, if you will? What? Uh, where are you from? Well, um, originally I'm from Minnesota, uh, Twin Cities, and I moved here from Chicago, which is where I was living after college doing comedy. Okay. So, so did you? Did you, so you went to college in Minnesota? Um, I went to college in Wisconsin. Okay. So. Go Badgers. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I'm a lukewarm. You know, yes, I, that's where I went. Yeah. I'm lukewarm about it, like sports and um, pride in general. Especially but, like college sports gets yeah, a little weird. You know, people are like really into it, and it kind of freaks me out when people are collectively really into something like that. Uh, I went to art school. Yeah. So oh, that I, sounds great. I didn't have like I didn't have a go uh, fighting tape decks. Exactly. We didn't we didn't have any sports teams or anything. And I always you I was barely had a campus. Well, I was at the school. Manhattan was my campus. Uh, okay. I was at the School of Visual Arts, and I was always like, we should. Uh, we should put together like a basketball team and get like the kids at like the Fashion Design Institute in uh, Pratt. We should get them to all do, uh, and we can have all these terrible art school sports teams. See, I would have loved to go to a school that had no sports or that we could like make our own self design made up sports. I don't know. Art sports? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm smelling here the pitch for a great comedy film about an art school that needs to field a sports team to keep some sort of grant money or something. <laughs> yeah. And they have to yeah. corral in all the other art schools in the district to... That's not... That's, that's yeah. not terrible. It's, it's like as good a, as, like, it's dodgeball. Like, it's dodgeball meets art school confidential. <laughs> that it is. <laughs> so what did you go to school for? Theater. Okay. So I, like, it's like I could have... I wanted to just create my own little art school. But, um, yeah, it was, um, it was cool. It was, it was a fun to be a theater major. It's not really, like... A school that's known for that. Okay. Like we had, you know, it's like our classes were in this like old riot proof building that was built in the 70s where it was purposely hard to get around in. Uh. You know, it was like playing one of those Mario levels where you're like uh, wandering into rooms and there's just like a, a, a pod or there's nothing there or something or I, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> they're like, it was like a maze. And then across the street, there was this business school that had just been built like a year ago. Yeah. And just had like neon signage everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, so the design of your building it's similar to like the Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C., which is deliberately designed to make you feel uncomfortable and disoriented. Yeah, probably yeah. kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you studied theater there. So, were you acting in a lot of shows? Like, uh, what were you? You know, I was auditioning for a lot of shows. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was where I like kind of figured out that maybe I shouldn't be an actor. Uh, and I started doing improv and started directing theater. Okay. Um, so okay. I kind of got into that when I was there. And then I moved to Chicago and mostly did. Um, I had a little theater company where we did devised theater, where you start out improvising and then sort of um, turn it into a play. Turn it into a play that then would be staged later. Yeah, and then we'd, okay. then we'd stage the play. Oh, so play. you kind of workshopped it through scenes and then built out. Okay. And then, yeah, then we'd do plays. Did, did you also get involved in the improv scene in Chicago? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was like I.O. and the Annoyance and doing shows there and stuff. Okay. So what point in, while you're in Chicago did you say, like, I'm going to get out of the city. Oh. I got to come and to was, Los Angeles. And was it more sketch or improv? Uh, I was more into improv and then I got, in, I got really interested in TV writing, which I'm okay. still not employed doing. Uh, <laughs> Hey. Right now, but, it maintains an interest. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I, I yeah, I got interested in that, and I was never as like amazing at performing, I guess, as maybe a lot of the people. It's a really it's a really strong improv city. Yeah, it's a good place to like learn stuff and make friends and things. But I never wanted to move here. Okay, that was never a goal. I thought so, I was going to stay in Chicago hey, forever. Did you think maybe you'd get to New York eventually, though? No, I was just like. I had no no like end game exactly. I was just like, cool. I'm in Chicago. I've succeeded in moving out of this place I grew up in. Like success. And Chicago. That's a big city. That's not like no like. No, and it's great. It's like of a place. such a lovely place to live. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fuck those people. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you on that. <laughs> I've been like twice, so I feel like I can't say. But um, no, I like I was I had I was like 
the LA, why would anyone move there? And then, I don't know. Well, I, for the very longest time, was holding on to, you know, being from New York. I'm like, oh, yeah. if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. And then they're like, there might be some opportunities in LA. I'm like, I'll go make it there. I want to make it somewhere. <laughs> but I, I feel like all of us resist coming here. And then there's like some opportunity that seems like it's going to be. Did you have something like that? That's no. Our Venus fly trap. Absolutely uh, nothing. Why did you I, come it was here? just. Get on the wrong train? It was a whim. I don't know. I just like had this feeling that maybe it would. Well, first of all, there's. Um, no winter. There's a, actually that was like the hardest thing to oh, adjust. Because you're from Minnesota. From Minnesota, so, yeah. I miss the snow, but no, I don't know. I just had this feeling like it was maybe time to leave the Midwest and like see what was up. And it seemed like this is where all the writing happens. And that's why I came. Yeah, it's it was a good choice. I really like living here. But how long have you been here? Like three years, okay. three and a half. So okay. you're just getting your like legs under you. Yeah, I feel now I feel like a person finally. <laughs> yeah, it's like it takes like years to feel like. That's a what person. people tell me that they, when they move here. I'm from here. I grew oh. up like a mile from here. So when people fancy, <laughs> valley boy LA native. Um, but yeah, everyone that moves here, they always say like, people that have been here for a few years. Council, I hear people that just moved here that hate it. It's like you got to give it 18 months. Like yeah, I took to L. A. almost immediately. <laughs> yeah, like I like, like when you met me. Yeah. Like, I was pretty... I mean, I was convinced that you were, like, grew up in Northridge. <laughs> you know? But, I mean, it's like, I took to the city a lot faster than I thought. I think I was... Much like with you being like, I'm in Chicago. I've, like, left home. I yeah. think that's what this was. Even though my home was New York, and it's a city that so many people come to, when I came here, it was... I'm in a new pl- like I don't know. Right, you're like, oh, okay, good, I left home, I did it. Like, I don't know, there's, some, there's something about that, but... Um, also, people in the Midwest are really negative about LA on the whole. Like, I really thought it was this cultural wasteland. People Everyone in, like east of uh, Riverside is really negative about <laughs> yeah, LA. Yeah, I was going to say it really bothers me. The same way. I got to when I went to uh, school up north. My roommate was from Northern California, and I day one like, "Hi, Sean, nice to meet you." Uh, he goes, "Oh, where are you from?" Los Angeles. He goes, "You stole our water." I go, "I don't know what this is about. <laughs> are you going to hit me? You like, why do you hate me? Because I never experienced this before in my life. I'm like, what is this? Nonsense? You saw Chinatown. Yeah. You know what's up. No, but <laughs> um, okay. So you come out here, and did you yes. start doing improv again and stuff like that? Like, how, how did you did you get into the theater scene out here? Uh, not really. Um, no, I did. I took UCB classes, um, which were cool. And then I decided I was tired of doing improv, which was also a cool choice. <laughs> I don't know. I was like, I did it for long enough. And then I was like, it's time to stop. Um, and I've been writing scripts and sitting alone in a room a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's great. Um, I tried stand up for the first time when I moved here. I'd never done that before. How do you like that? I like it a lot and I never do it. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I, I do the storytelling stuff, but the idea of doing stand up to me is I feel like it's on such another level and I'm not like equipped to do it, even though I probably could make myself equipped to it's do like it. It's like really just talking, I think is mm. the you know, it's like there's not it's talking with like the audience has expectations, you know. Yeah. Make yeah. me laugh, funny boy. Yeah, I'm not gonna make you I'll make you laugh a little bit. <laughs> but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be joke, joke, joke. I mean like me too, probably. <laughs> But see, I appreciate that when I see stand-up comedy. But I'm, you know, a different kind of audience. Um, so, but you still, you make, like, you make a lot of videos and stuff like that. That you, you write, so, like, you make short stuff and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I saw a video uh, where you had mannequin arms, oh, for example. Yes. <laughs> I watched this, which I was, which I found very amusing. Thank because you. I was not sure where this could be going. And how was that mannequin <laughs> arm going to pick up that cup of coffee? Uh, <laughs> you know what? Spoiler alert with difficulty. <laughs> I'm glad you watched that. I feel like not enough people watch that, and I stand I stand by it. I, I think it was fun. <laughs> well, I enjoyed your performance in it, too, because you have this look on your face the entire time <laughs> that says everything without saying a word. That's You know what? I, when I was in college, part of the reason I stopped acting was that I got criticized a lot, and, uh, and so many of my teachers told me I was a face actor. Do you know that's a thing? I didn't know that's a thing, but I could see it. <laughs> It would, they didn't mean it as a compliment. Uh-oh. It was not a good... Is that when you tell someone thing. they got a face for radio? Like, what does that mean? They were, uh, I thought it meant you have, like, a, uh, an expressive face. I, that is what they meant. Yeah. They, and that, I always thought that was a good thing. And then they were like, oh, but it, like, stops at your neck. Like, you're just... You're, the rest of you is doing <laughs> just nothing. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, you are a talking head. <laughs> Literally. Hence mannequin arms. Exactly. Just get the... Yep. 
Yeah. The rest of it. That's where I. That's where I thrive. I should have mannequin arms and everything. Um, and then I was also watching a video, and this is why I was a little thrown when you said Minnesota. I watched a video where you were from Canada. Oh. <laughs> that it's it's played like. Oh, this poor Canadian girl. I mean, they're close, right? Yeah, well, they're clo- close enough. I yeah, guess. no, I was just appropriating. I'm just, oh. just appropriating Canadian culture. And Sorry, that, was like a, that was like a BuzzFeed video or something? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty soon after I moved did here. You, did, you, did you write that video also? Or you just didn't No, oh. I just uh, got called in to be a Canadian for the day because... Because I'm so polite. And there you go. Yeah, Minnesota kidding. nice. I, I am Minnesota nice. <laughs> but you know that means passive aggressive. Yeah. So. Well, it's like in the South. And the, oh, bless your heart. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so. Um, But you've written for a lot of, lot of uh, 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 things since you've been out here. Uh, uh, Reductress, right? You've written some stuff for them. Yeah. About, um, like, uh, what, what have you written for them? Man, Which, by the way, that's a, a site. That I would always see people, people we've booked on this show. Yeah. And I'd always see, and be like, what is this website? Because it's not a website on my radar until right. we have people on for the show. <laughs> and I didn't, it didn't occur to me until recently, like, oh, it's a satirical women's magazine. Yeah. Like, I didn't know what the site was and why wasn't Were it Were you one of these people that, like, to read some of the articles and think, oh, is this real? Or like, <laughs> I wasn't sure what You're was like, happening. Are you like yeah. deeply offended by them? Post would, angry Facebook comments. I, was, I would do send that. nasty <laughs> tweets to <laughs> every woman who wrote a thing for the. Yeah. Yeah. How Good. dare you? You dox yeah. them. Yeah, you yeah. Just, he was straight up Gamergate. Fantastic. What have you What have you written for them? Uh, you know, it's been a really long time since I've written for them, and uh, and which is just because I haven't pitched, um, I guess, but. They are great, and everyone should be reading them because um, I think they're so much, what they've been doing the last, especially like the last couple of years, they're just getting like better and better. They feel like they, it feels like yeah, they're really getting their feet under them, and they, they tend to be very like much slyer than the onion, mm-hmm. and like to the point where sometimes it's a little slippery. Like you don't know, is this a real thing or is this you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'm like yeah. I I read it a lot still, and what? I'm so I'm so impressed I, with everything they're doing. Am I making this up? You wrote something was it about like lettuce ramps or something? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so that yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, I'm uh, I have it has been a while since I I saw a headline, so. but it was the kind of thing that like if I didn't know that you were like a funny person <laughs> and I saw that I could believe yeah. like oh this is just some hipster nonsense <laughs> yeah like yeah of course they'd be like ranking this or telling I giving you some I think yeah. that one was it was ranking all the like sh- stuff that you don't want like all the food what was it yeah like all the things that you want that that, that aren't the burger you wanted exactly that was, yeah, yeah, that was exactly was. you have to get in a lettuce wrap like chicken yeah. teriyaki <laughs> that's what it was yes 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 uh, yeah but you know I remember, it's just, it's like maybe someone's going to read it for the advice and maybe they're going to read it for the humor. So who knows? I read it for the quizzes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very informative. You also have your own lifestyle I'm blog. a successful lifestyle blogger. <laughs> yes, as you as you are want to remind us. Yeah. <laughs> every other sentence. It's my adequate lifestyle and it seems like you have an adequate lifestyle. I think I do. Uh, I think everyone should, if you want to have an adequate lifestyle, everyone should read it because... I'll tell you how to have one. Um, and, yeah, I love that everyone starts with as a successful lifestyle blog. Yes. Uh, well, I hear you're supposed to have a, a brand, a hashtag brand, yeah. um, before you, when you do it. So my brand is successful lifestyle blogger, so I decided to just really, like, go with it. Yes, and I love how you just bold, you'll bold words in there constantly <laughs> where you're just trying to positively affirm these ideas within the paragraph. People do now, it, so. Now, how do you... I mean, this is your life, and this is your life's work, clearly. It is. <laughs> but, like, I see a thing that, like, uh, being a mop. <laughs> like, the idea for writing that blog post was this, like, because you have those things on your feet. Where yeah. You're, was this one of those, you saw these things and, like, I need to be a mop? Or did you, like, I just need to fucking clean my floor? <laughs> How am I going to do this? And then you got the idea for the blog. They're pretty much all inspired by, like, real life. I, every once in a while I stage something for the blog, but most, like, that one, um, my roommate is an art director and sometimes brings random things into our house, as, like, props she was, or had ordered for work or something, and the mop socks were, <laughs> came into the house. Um, I honestly tell you, I need some mop socks. They didn't work that well. Mm. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I had such high hopes, but I was genuinely trying out the mop socks. And then I was like, should I just blog about this? Because it seems lifestyle I just use a regular mop, Sean, like a 
Personally. Well, I have I, I got like, I got laminate most in all of my apartments. Wow. So I gotta I got to get the Swiffer out and then I gotta make sure I don't Swiffer myself into a corner. <laughs> you know, I just gotta think through this. It's a whole <laughs> it's thing. Because the second I finish Swiffering the kitchen, that's the second I'm like, oh crap, I need that thing from the kitchen. See, things are hard. That's what my adequate lifestyle is about, is how doing things is hard. <laughs> so let me ask you, and this is like a weird <laughs> There's like a specific voice to I don't know how to say this. Um, Uh-oh. No, no. It's like, <laughs> ooh. Do you think, like, there is uh, different gendered voices to comedy? Interesting. And I'll, I'll tell you, like, the what I'm coming at this from is, like, and I hear this a lot from female comedians where, like, they'll say, guys just get up there, when, especially, like, stand-up comedy. And they talk about, you know, their penises and blowjobs and, you know, vaginas are scary and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's late, you know. It's, it's it, clever. It's, it's really. <laughs> yeah, but, like, um... Is there? Do you think there's like an alternate, like an alternate voice to female comedy? Um, blanket, yeah. no. But I think yeah. that we, um, I think that everyone's comedic voice is really right. uh, dependent on what, like. Okay, hang on. <laughs> so the question came out like really weird. No, I have an <laughs> answer. I have an answer. I'm just I'm formulating it I, yeah. because uh, okay, uh, <laughs> because I feel like. This is, I feel like it's a weird, like, delicate subject. Um, But I think that everyone's comedic voice is really uh, personal to them and also is reflective of, of, like, so many things about how everything that's happened to them in their life up to the point where they're doing comedy. But I also think that when people are starting out in comedy, they tend to imitate things that they've seen. Mm. Um, And I think there's a lot of male comedy to imitate. uh, And there's a very specific masculine comedy genre that's really easy to kind of, like, just be like, I'm going to do that. And kind of know what that is. And there are so many women who have done comedy in the past, but I don't know that they've coalesced into this like single genre that's easy to mimic the same way like my penis is cool and vaginas are scary, yeah. <laughs> you know, is like a, is a, is a type of comedy. So I, I think maybe there's just. Well, do you think with like positions. sites like Reductress and stuff, are creating more of a voice or. Is, is creating sort of an alternate sphere where you can kind of get inspiration from and then take it and say, okay, I saw what they're doing there. Can I take this to the next level? Yeah, I think to some degree it okay. is. Um, because, I mean, so, so much of that type of comedy is, I mean, really it's just, it's satire, which is, yeah. which is, I guess, always been a genre. But yeah, that there's sort of a feminine satire voice. I think that's more, okay, so that's that's kind of what I was looking for. So it's like, it feels like, on that side, on that side, I feel like, no, but like you're saying that like female satire seems to be so strong, whereas with male comedians, it's like aggressive, um, self-congratulatory in a way. I don't know what I'm saying here, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think because... Historically, yeah. this is starting to feel like an essay. Um, <laughs> historically, since, like since the dawn of time, <laughs> women have gotten shamed for saying "I'm great" or yeah. even saying "I'm okay," and so okay. there's a self-deprecating. You know, even just to exist. I mean, even just to exist in like non-comedy scenarios, women often feel like they have to be like, "I don't know," but or like, "I don't know." What if we did this and and preface everything? Use a lot of qualifiers. I do it all the time, um, but especially in comedy that there's this and in comedy it's like everyone is you know there's kind of a self-deprecating edge to comedy anyway so i yeah. think it's just magnified with women i was sometimes. just thinking of one of the articles you wrote about the email filter the email app that <laughs> removes that, that for women that removes all words from their emails and yeah that was based on a real email filter <laughs> yeah. that uh was coming out around the time i wrote it and i never i don't think i ever used it but it was supposed to flag when you were using words like just or um if that makes sense, I don't remember what the other ones were, but all the things we say to yeah. try to undermine our own credibility. I remember this because a friend of mine actually was posting about it, but as like a legitimate thing where she was saying, oh, this is kind of ridiculous, but I didn't realize how much I was doing this until the, the filter app, not that she used it, but just that, that became, she was reading the article about it. I was like, oh, I do this all the time. It's so real. Yeah. <laughs> it's so real. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, like asking permission all the time for, yeah. mm-hmm. and then we're, I remember that. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I think there is something to um, often women looking for sort of a less aggressive way to make a point. But we don't have to, and we shouldn't. No. Exactly. <laughs> I, feel I have to. So, I have to follow it up with something really aggressive. So, <laughs> sorry. 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 <laughs> so what is next? 
for Aww. Julie Pearson. What are you working on now? Are you doing any other shows? Um, I am. I don't know when this is coming out, so it might be might be late. But I'm. Uh, I work. I work on a show called the Sunday Night Mystery Show. We have a show on Sunday, which is. Um, is it every Sunday? It is not every Sunday. It's like once a month ish. Um, but we're doing a. a the premise of the show is a drinking show where none of the actors have seen the script until the show is <laughs> happening. Really fun to watch. Um, but very fun and very festive. And we're doing a musical-themed Halloween show this Sunday that I helped write. So I'm excited mm, we will, for that. This episode will probably come up right when that yeah. show is aired. Okay, what, so I'm the, currently doing that. Is but <laughs> do you, is there one then planned for November? Um, is there a Thanksgiving-themed one in November? There's not nothing scheduled that I know of. And prob- I mean, holidays. Who knows? Um, but... Keep well, an eye out when, for the Sunday Night Mystery Show. Sunday Night Mystery Show. When one of those is coming up, uh, will you let us know and we will put it on our Facebook page? Sure will. Um, any Anything else? Any other storytelling shows or things uh, like that? Or any other writing that's going to pop up somewhere? No shows scheduled. Still, I'm still being adequate. Uh, there you go. So the, those, are, those are still real. I'm working on some stuff to, to, you know, maybe film in the far future, but I don't, I don't know how to talk about that. And <laughs> where, where can the people find out? Like if people want, if people like... I gotta know. I gotta see the next thing she writes. Where do you post this stuff? Where do the where can the people go to find out about you? Uh, the people can go on Twitter and follow me at J Pears. Uh, okay. And I mean myadequatelifestyle.com is ready to guide you in your life. And you have your own website also. I do. JulieMFPearson.com. Perfect. Perfect. And if you are a good listener of the podcast, you've already been to My Adequate Lifestyle. You've already been. To Julie's uh, website, you're already following her on Twitter because we have a link to her stuff on our Facebook page. <laughs> so, uh, you want to talk some topics with us? Yeah, you had I no do. choice but to say yes. <laughs> I have so to. <laughs> you have me. You're here now. I've been grilled, and I must. Um, I must contribute. So Netflix, you watch a lot of Netflix. I watch a ton of Netflix. Yeah. Sean, you watch a lot of Netflix. I watch. Some Netflix. I feel like I watch the least Netflix of this group, even though I watch a lot of Netflix you were, shows. You were a big Bloodline head. I didn't watch Bloodline. No. <laughs> but, but I like I that think, as a thing. No. I think part of it is Keep that... Keep talking about Hemlock Grove. I, <laughs> I have... Uh, I don't have Netflix. Okay. I, no one has Netflix, let's be honest. There are two Netflix accounts. Yes, in the world, that's yeah. it. There are right. two. Well, I'm using There's one. There's Adam and Eve, and that's it. And we all just do, exist I'm using, from there. I'm using one of one of them. I'm, we're all on Bob Blankenheim's Netflix account. I'm using Bob Blankenheim's Netflix account. But he uses my HBO, so I think it's a fair trade. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm paying more. I think this is how we structure families now. Like, if you don't have a nuclear family, you know, they, they, they think, like, okay, an account is for a family... But I think our families are now made up. It used to be your cell phone plan, and now it's like, who do you share passwords with? Very quickly, with? before my, my current brother-in-law, when she, he and my sister were still dating, they were engaged, but they weren't married yet. All of a sudden, one day, he has his own profile on the family Netflix. I'm like, what is this nonsense? That's He's not he, even the family. I'm when he not, the I family. haven't been bold enough like to do my own. I feel like I have to have Bob do that for me. Yeah. Like I can't just go in and then suddenly, like, well, even though I probably should. Yeah. But the point I'm making here in a very yeah. long one. Netflix is going to make 80 original films next year and spend $8 billion on programming. Here's the thing that's driving me a little crazy. And we were watching the World Series before you got here, Julie. Before. And there was a... And there was a um, <laughs> they can't see you point. And there's... and was there, for you guys. <laughs> and there was a commercial for this new Netflix movie, Bright. Uh, which they've clearly thrown a shitload of money in. It's, starting, it's a Will Smith movie. Yeah. And am I in the minority where, like, I don't cruise Netflix just to be like, what's this new thing? Like, I only see things if they come firmly on my radar. And very rarely do any of these original movies come firmly on my radar, unless they're getting some sort of Oscar push or something. Uh, and, like... I don't... People, like, every day there's a new Netflix show. When you go on Netflix, you're like, here's 40 things that just got added. You're like, nope. Yeah, and I don't (laughs) look at any of them because I've come here for a specific purpose. 
but, but I guess there are other people who don't have cable like I do, and they just go screw Netflix. What's like your Netflix viewing habits? And let me ask you this: Do you think your Netflix viewing habits can sustain eighty original films? <laughs> Well, I'm like a huge TV watcher and I hardly ever watch movies because I would rather commit to like 12 episodes of a TV show in one sitting than a 90 minute movie. Which in general, seems counterintuitive. Like it, seems that, like, it seems like less of a time commitment. That's the exact opposite of my <laughs> thinking, but go on. So I, so I haven't watched as many of the, I watch a lot of stuff that's on Netflix. I haven't watched as many of the films, but it seems like they are basically theatrical films yeah. it's like they have the star power they have director power they have everything that theatrical films have some theatrical releases and stuff and they're but you never have to leave the house yeah i mean it's it's like well, our, ha- our habits are changing well, any of the other well, for example like for you you're a big noah bombach fan he has a brand new movie the meyerowitz stories starring dustin hoffman and adam sandler and Just you ha- and ben stiller and you haven't watched it yet i haven't watched it and i've probably had two hours where i could have snuck that in yeah. and i have not watched it because it's like it just feels like it sounds so stupid. It feels like more of a... Ch- if the Noah Baumbach movie was in the theaters, I would have seen it already. <laughs> uh, because it's on Netflix, it feels like this weird thing of like, well, I have to watch a Netflix show instead. Yeah. And instead, I binge watch American Vandal, which is fucking brilliant. Oh, it's amazing. It's so good. Um, And, and that's... Here's the other thing. I don't like binge watching. Now, you just said you'll, like, like I'll spend 12 hours and spend all that. Yeah, I'm a huge binge I, watcher. I dread binge watch. Like, this weekend, I will binge watch Stranger Things. And I'm excited for Stranger Things, but I'm dreading the commitment of binge watching. And I prefer shows that, like, if Stranger Things was a week-to-week show, I feel like each week we'd get together and be like, did you see what happened? I don't know. But we can't do this because when I see you Saturday night. Oh, I'll be done. <laughs> uh, you might be done. I might be two episodes away. Someone will have only watched two, and we can't talk about it. Like, you were able to talk about it. It just drives me insane. Why don't we just commit to watch a mayor with stories instead, and we'll talk about that. <laughs> Maybe we can do that. Okay, but here's the other question. Recently, the Academy has been looking at Netflix eligibility, and they don't know what to do with this. They don't know what to do about this. Um, because I think members of the Academy don't want these Netflix films to be in the nominating process. And I kind of agree with them. And I don't know whether I'm being like, I'm being too old fashioned here, but I don't understand why these movies aren't considered TV movies because their shows are considered TV shows. What am I, what's the disconnect I'm missing here, Julie? I mean, I, like, it's well. I think it really just comes down to it. We're the way we consume media is changing so much. Where it used to be that you had to go out to the theater to go see. So basically, these movies, if they weren't being released on Netflix, they would be released in a movie theater. Right. Yeah. You know, like this, someone would, someone else would buy this script maybe, and they would produce it, and it would get released in a theater like regular. Other Netflix movies also get the, theatrical. Oh, to qualify, they, to qualify. To qualify for if they the, think, like, yeah. Okja this year. Got, well, the Meyerowitz stories. The Meyerowitz like stories. They gotten, uh, uh, Okja got a theatrical mm-hmm. release for at least one week in New York, one week in LA, and it actually played in LA for a while to New Beverly. But, um, but it's just to qualify for an Oscar. And, and the thing is, I loved Okja. I know, had I gotten off my ass and went to see in the theater, I would have loved it more. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's I guess, comes down... Because I think we, we're we thinking of Netflix right now as this is a television service. But really, it's an, I mean, it's just a service. It's not television Content. any more than it's a film service. It's just that we are currently thinking of it as a television service because it's how we've watched our television. Can, exactly. <laughs> But I don't know if it's inherent. I just, I mean, it kind of bums me out I, that we're, like, moving away from this go out to the theater kind of thing. Well, well that's like, the thing that I think they're trying to protect, and that's why I think they're also against it. I think the Academy is trying to protect the theater experience, which I'm also all about, too. Here's a fix. What if the Academy said you can only qualify for Academy consideration if you have a one-week theatrical release prior to any video-on-demand distribution or online distribution? So if Oak Joe was only playing for a week in theaters, and then it gets released on Netflix. I think that's a fair compromise. Yeah, and that way they can pick their spots so they don't say, here's 80 movies we want considered that happen to also play in the theaters because some landmark needed a spot to fill and we can just dump it on the screen there. 
No, here's what's funny though. Like, am I with stories of playing for a week? You know, at a yeah. you may not see it in the well, theater. Isn't but that the rule that they passed in France maybe. with the Cannes Film Festival? With the festival, because Okja was in competition at Cannes, and when the Netflix logo came up, they booed. Yeah. Uh, and they, they they Netflix. They pa- passed a rule where you can't. Uh, you can't. You. <laughs> If it's you're going to play a con, you it's have fun. to have a theatrical run in France before being on Netflix or okay. something like that. Like a significant theatrical... Envelope rouge. But I think, that's, I think that's a fair compromise to yeah. this. Like, oh, you're two weeks in theaters and then it's on Netflix. Or even forever. one week, because every other movie needs a week in a theatrical release. Two weeks. I mean, honestly, Make that's... them suffer. <laughs> it's really such a you drop were... in the bucket in terms of, like, we're, ta- we're thinking about this in a very New York and L.A.-centric right. way. Think of it, whereas, put on your Minnesota hat. I mean, right. It was, which is what I'm saying. It doesn't... It wouldn't matter well, see, to me in any way there. It's like the, the one-week theatrical release has nothing to do well, with well, that's in Minnesota. The, that's the other thing I have to keep reminding myself. There are movies that are going on Netflix that somebody in like Omaha would never get to see. Like the new Robert Redford Jane Fonda movie. Mm-hmm. Which apparently oh, is that was a Netflix movie. Yeah, it's also on there. It's also on and my that's list. why it's not on my fucking radar. Supposedly very good. Um, well, here's a, here's a problem we're going to face Yeah. come I'll this Oscar it. season. <laughs> And it, it involves race because that's not a messy subject. <laughs> um, this no, is good, thing we're all, good thing we're all white people here to talk about this issue. Hey, you don't know what I look like. Um, <laughs> we've been for 271 episodes. We've been passing him off as Asian, <laughs> and now you. Oh you yeah, you should probably examine that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, okay, so there's a new movie by D. Reese. Um, Tied it up at the top. Okay. Sorry. There's a new movie by D. Reese uh, coming out called Mudbound. D. Reese did this amazing film that I loved a few years back called Pariah um, about this young, uh, this black teenage lesbian girl. Um, a teenage and, lesbian girl, you say? Yeah. And Mudbound is her, is her new film. This It got raves at Sundance. Netflix bought it for a lot of money. This is clearly an Oscar contending movie. I am calling, and the trailer looks amazing. And this is one like Okja that is on my radar. I will watch this on Netflix the week it drops, even though I should go see it in the theater. Um, and I have no doubt it's brilliant. And I bet you she doesn't get an Oscar nomination for director. But I'm telling you right now, unlike 99% of the time, this won't be about race, this won't be about gender, it will be about Netflix. But it's going to get labeled as race and gender. I'm cutting this problem off at the past. I'm telling you, I, it's it's going to be Netflixism. <laughs> I'm 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 serious. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> Thoughts? I think you're right. Okay. I have no idea what I think well, about do this. Think, <laughs> what do you think Moonlight would have? Moonlight had been open. Had had been if released. If Moonlight just had on been Netflix. on Netflix, it wouldn't have gotten Oscar nominations. I'm telling you that right now. That's possibly true. I th- also and think- it won Best Picture. Well, unless Netflix wants to spend the money to really like play the game. I guess I, I guess I think that I I feel like it's I don't really see the relevant I just feel like this is so on this is the first year that the Netflix films have been in, in, a contender for no. this. Uh, they uh, they tried this first like, uh, two or was it three years ago? Beasts of No Nation and ooh, Idris yeah, Elba right. won a SAG award, didn't even get an Oscar nomination, and he was much better than some people who did. Okay, and I think it was a it's a resistance to Netflix. That might be true. Yeah, I guess I, that this is the first year they've had like these huge star power like they're going stronger full, this year. You know, uh, so so it seems like. Well, I mean, I think it might have to do with awareness, too, because people are, like, looking at movies that are theatrical released and not paying attention to these movies in the same way. If Netflix wants to get Mudbound some some Oscar nominations, they have to take some of that $8 billion. They have to have screenings up all around Los Angeles. They've got to have special screenings. They have to send out screeners. They have to do everything. They They have to play the game. And... I honestly see, as of now, Netflix hasn't been willing to play the game. They want to change the game, but I think first you have to play the game. They are playing the most dangerous game of all. But then I have a point about this that I think the way and movie theater, the experience has changed, changed so much, the movie theater experience over the last several years where like... It almost seems it's like it's becoming prohibitive to go to the movies because it's so expensive. It is, yeah. And like now every theater has amenity. Like it's not the experience that it used to be on the whole. So I think that 
Netflix and other other services reacting. Amazon's done a little bit of it too, buying films. I think that them reacting against it to make make movies more accessible is it's natural to the way that movie going is kind of getting out of control. Amazon though has doubled down on the theater experience still though because Manchester by the Sea that was a uh, you know they've got they've got more films and, coming out this and year and those movies come out first in theaters and then are like exclusive yeah. to Amazon Plus. Yeah. Um, and if you're patient, you could see them then. But, you know, I'm not patient. But again, is this also a problem in, in? I mean, well, I was about to say, I paid like $16 to go see The Killing of Sacred Deer. That's a lot of fucking money. Um, it's a very sacred deer. And I was about to say, but are you paying $16 in Omaha to see a movie? Is this, again, a New York, L.A. thing? But then they're probably not even seeing Killing of a Sacred Deer in Omaha. I don't know. The poor people of Omaha. I've shit on them enough during this <laughs> thing. Omaha. I hear- I hear Omaha's a cool city. Right, in the, right I don't, in the heart of middle America. I don't know. I mean, Nebraska's the worst from my experience. Well, Omaha's speaking cool. of middle America. Uh, that's not the middle America. No, Do you I not need, know where a map is? I needed a transition, and I took it. Okay. <laughs> Audience, you, you tell us if this next bit is about middle America. It's, it's not. Speaking of non-New York, L.A., coastal elitist cities, <laughs> Biloxi, Mississippi. Biloxi Blues. You ever be to Bil- 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 You ever go to Biloxi? <laughs> <laughs> no, never been to Mississippi. No, neither have Anyone I. Anyone been to Mississippi? I'm not, although I do want to visit. Do you? Yeah, yeah. W- William Faulkner. Oh, I should have figured that was it. Yeah. <laughs> well, would they do to Faulkner what they're doing uh, to Harper Lee? Uh, okay, so... Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Faulkner was a good old boy. Yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird is being banned by a school in Biloxi, Mississippi for making people uncomfortable. To quote the vice president of the school district, there is some language in the book that makes people uncomfortable and we can teach the same lesson with other We use the N-word enough in this this school. Uh, Yeah, 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 wait, what is that saying? Um... This really bothers me because, to me, To Kill a Mockingbird is one of the greatest books ever written. One of Hot the take. great, uniquely American books ever written. Um, now, a few years back, you got into an argument on this podcast with a friend of the show, Will Stegman. Yeah. About the slippery slope. This was a, a discussion about trigger warnings at the time. And you argued about this exact scenario mm-hmm. that we were going to start to get books being banned for all sorts of reasons. And we had to find some middle ground. And that yeah. they're just taking a page out of the liberal playbook and just applying it to something now that we don't agree with. Is this what's happening here? Of course. <laughs> Julie, is this what's happening here? I don't know. I think what's happening really is just a like unwillingness to dig into our history of slavery and racism. And so you think they're avoiding the problem, or do you think there's some people who are actually bothered, though? I mean, it could be legitimately, because we had a friend who taught uh, a film class, and he showed him the film To Kill a Mockingbird. And now, I remember when I both read the book and saw the film, when I heard the N-word used in it, I had no, like, reaction of shock or any i mean i thought it was terrible terrible but i wasn't like because it was it's in context yes yeah he showed this to a bunch of kids it must have been eighth grade the movie and when the first time they heard the n-word in the movie the kids were like all gas like they were so shocked to hear it and that was a reaction that me and my classmates and things did not have back in the day and i'm not quite sure why that is like what has changed instead are we is it better because we're more acknowledging of how terrible that is the word is or have we put the word on such a like a pedestal of horrors that like i'm not i'm not sure how to feel about all this i wonder and this is a hypothesis but i wonder if kids have more because because they're more connected to read they're probably reading think pieces by the time they're eight yeah. uh, the box explainers <laughs> right um the, 
you know, I mean, I grew up in a really predominantly white area in the upper Midwest where Minnesota? everyone's like, every, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's like, oh, racism was a thing that happened a long time ago. To which people is far, like, far away. Like how they <laughs> basically taught, you know, they, I, remember, I remember like in, well, when I went to like a fairly sheltered Catholic school, but I like being taught you know, Malcolm X and MLK in school and kind of them being like, they did all this work so that everything's fine now. Was sort of the subtext of everything that was, you know, <laughs> taught to us. And not having access to, my parents aren't particularly political, not having access to like a lot of alternate information yeah. means that I think I personally, I'm guessing a lot of people like, you know, in the 90s, late 90s or whatever, didn't have a ton of access to information that would put that word in context and make it, you know, you maybe have, you understand that it's a bad word, but yeah. you also understand that like every swear word is a bad word. And you know, that the, um, that the, I wonder if, I guess what I'm, this is really long winded. What I'm wondering is if kids have more context now to understand why that word is a problem. That's true. Whereas I don't think I had that context when I was like reading this. So your reaction kid. would be very different then. Yes. Yeah. Where I would be like, I understand this is a word that's not okay. And I understand that this has a bad history, but I don't but understand. What does this have to do with me? Yeah. I don't understand the depth of it. And I wonder if kids have more access to that information because they're like reading things online earlier. What, um, so one thing it doesn't say here is, what is this a predominantly white school? Is this a like a mm -hmm. you know? Is this one? Is this a school that has a uh, you know in major African American I read, population? It never really because that really into changes because depending on what the racial makeup of the school is, that changes the valence of this whole discussion. It does is it you know we don't want to upset the the white kids because you know so, you know states' well, rights or do we want or we don't want to upset African American kids because it can be viewed as offensive. I mean, maybe this is as someone who doesn't travel through the South often, but right. I imagine that many school districts there would be very mixed. Am I wrong in thinking Yeah, because there's been a lot of, like, resegregation. Um, you know, like, a lot of white kids that can end up going to private schools. So the, the system almost resegregates itself based on... So, But I don't know. Like, well, it's not a private school. Right, but that... I, I, it changes the conversation based on what this, no, you know, what right. this school looks like. Yeah. Um, um, well, let me ask you, if they're banning this, are they also going to ban Huck Finn? Are they going to ban, you know... Yeah, wait a second, Huck Finn, yeah. 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 <laughs> is that oh. because also Huck Finn is like more of a way back when? Like, oh, that was during slave time, so that at least has some uh, context. This is like that weird I am mid-20th century Southern well, racism. But I mean, wait a second, but there's context to the, the South and the era of what Harper Lee was growing up. No, in. but it's like, oh, with Huck Finn, oh, slavery was still a thing, so... If I anything, To Kill a Mockingbird is a much more racially sensitive book. It's about dealing with injustice and from a, a child's perspective of this. Um, the other thing that uh, I think is uh, uh, that I'm, you know, okay. So we've recently had this big controversy about the Confederate statues. Which I agree should be taken down, mostly because for two reasons. One, you lost the fucking war, buddy. <laughs> you were the villains in the war, and you lost. But also, too, most of those statues were put up during the Jim Crow era, mostly to be like, like, hey, we're going to show our dominance over, you know, over black people. I worry that, though, that ends up we see that, like, we have to take that down, and all of a sudden people who don't think in a nuanced way take it to stuff like this. There's also a big controversy about Gone with the Wind now. Yeah. Gone with the Wind is one of the greatest films ever made. And for many filmmaking reasons. Yeah. There are some... So Birth of a Nation. There are some <laughs> racial issues, and Birth of a Nation <laughs> has many more racial issues in it, because I think at the heart of... <laughs> Gone with the Wind. I mean, it's about people in the Confederacy, but it's not... Uh, about the birth of the KKK. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You don't have people running around in blackface. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it will upset me if we're living in an era where we can't watch Gone with the Wind. Okay. I mean, well, am I wrong in thinking <laughs> yeah, that? Well, Netflix is going to put it on your TV, so you don't have to leave the so you can watch it. Within, <laughs> you don't have to go out and shame yourself by watching it in public. I, you know, it's so funny because I was thinking I've never seen Gone with the Wind on the big screen. That's a movie that should be seen on the big screen. And I've been trying to check those off, those boxes off. You know, it's Lawrence of Arabia <laughs> and Space Odyssey. Um, Ghost one, Dad. One more thing, and now I feel like I'm being like a real like 
straw man or something like <laughs> that. But but uh, maybe straw man's not the right word. What about blazing saddles? We're going to get to a point where people have a problem with blazing saddles. And I know this is terrible because it sounds like I'm making an argument that we should be allowed to be saying the N word, but, <laughs> yeah. but 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 you also know what I'm what I'm saying. I mean that is a I mean that's one of the funniest movies ever made. Hey, it's the bottom of the ninth. <laughs> um, um, we get into uncomfortable topics here on the Will Show. Well, we saw sexism and racism. We should move on to politics. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but do you know what I'm saying? Like I, I think there is, I mean. It's what not is a, it? And is it's not a, it's not a racist movie. Blazing Saddles? Yeah. Okay, well there's I think <laughs> okay, so there's anything that was made before a certain year is probably going to have on some level if it's a race level, if it's a gender level, something that's objectionable yeah, to before some the degree. election of Barack Obama. And I don't <laughs> cuz that fixed everything. <laughs> yeah. Um but like so I, I mean, yeah, I don't think I don't think the answer is to to get rid of everything that was made before a certain year. But there are different degrees. I mean, yeah, there's there's a difference between something that shows the South during the Civil War and something that shows blackface. And like, yeah, those are, yeah. I think, and glorifies all of it. Yeah. yeah, and like, or if it's you know, it's like, I mean. I mean, like, there's a difference between, like, I'm going to keep supporting all Roman Polanski's movies and, like, I'm going to watch something that has a lot of questionable, you know, like, 50s gender politics in it. You know, like, there's, uh, I think, I think there's, there are gradients. And, like, these things aren't going to go away. They're not going to go away. No, I don't <laughs> think they, they are. I don't but think they are. I also think it's a fallacy, too, to apply modern sensibilities. So, you know, this happens a lot in academia where, you know, you'll have historians that'll go and shit all over the 18th century because they didn't adhere to the standards of early 21st century Berkeley, you know? <laughs> right. And, like, they spend their whole careers just, like, poo-pooing, you know, history. Having an awareness of things doesn't mean getting rid of them, though. Yeah. I think that's... And that's con- one of those and context of- is key also. Yeah. You know? And I feel like this is an example of where something's being stripped out of its context and just being uh, removed from the environment because, um, you know, because someone doesn't want to do the hard work of really putting this into perspective. I, uh, when Gene Wilder died, yeah. I went to a screening of Blazing Saddles that weekend because they yeah. re-released it into theaters. And in the audience I would say there were a lot of people who'd never seen it before who like just wanted to come out and like oh I always meant to sit I love Willy Wonka and a lot of people who I think skewed a little younger too and (laughs) tenth inning (laughs) when they uh, the first time someone said the n-word in that movie the gas from the audience I will say, made the people who knew this was coming laugh harder in a weird way. Because it was like, like, oh my god, like, I know it's Shanka, but you've never seen this and you didn't have any idea what you were, were going to see. Um, I don't know. I just think, I, 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 I mean... But it's the same kind of gas Maybe like I'm when you watch a about- movie and like a, all of a sudden like a dick shows up on screen because you're not expecting it and it's yes. transgressive. Yes, yeah. that's what it and was. naughty. Yeah. That's what it was. Um... The um, but I, I'm starting to worry about the slippery slope. Okay. But I also acknowledge that we can't be insensitive pricks. I think there's something to acknowledging that maybe some things aren't o- like okay. If this thing was made now, this context wouldn't be okay. The fact that I still like it because I grew up with it kind of makes me like a shitty old person. Like, I think there's something to accepting that. I, I mean, there's something... It's more problematic to it, watch, like, episodes of Friends, I think, than, uh, you know... <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's also true. But, but, you know, but I think well, there's something to, into accepting that, like, oh, yeah, this maybe isn't, you know, this maybe wouldn't fly now, and, like, rather than defending it to the death, maybe of just being like, oh, I'm kind of a shitty old person who's going to still laugh at this, or, you know, whatever. Like, I think just owning the... But we're not saying Blazing Saddles is that thing. I'm Nobody's not saying, saying that. Saying no one's that. coming out No one's saying that. You're blazing saddles. No one's saying that. I'm just saying, like... <laughs> I'm just saying I think maybe it's on us to deal with the cognitive dissonance of yeah. this issue rather than like making blanket rules about what's banned or what's not or who's too sensitive. I don't know. <laughs> it's on us, the people at Will Shump Podcast. Yes. Well, we're solving it. We're just ticking off boxes. Um, yeah. we've, we've gotten some heavy uh, areas. Well, tonight. last week we fixed Harvey Weinstein, so, you know. Yeah. Oh, oh did you? you? I can't, can't, can't wait Weinstein. to hear that. It's <laughs> fixing yeah. the Harvey Oh, boy, hey, I look, bet that we went just, great. What happens during the week, we can't help it. We can't help it. Um... So I do not watch The Tonight Show. And the other week, I was reminded 
why. The Tonight Show now comes in third in the ring. The once great Tonight Show that everyone would tune into every night. It's now third because our nation continues to spiral into chaos. We have these strong voices now because of this. We have Jimmy Kimmel and Stephen Colbert. They've spoken up. They've spoken up uh, about what's happening in the country because they're fucking Americans. Seth Meyers. But little Jimmy Fallon has stayed the course making Mandy Moore play beer pong and Justin Bieber crush an egg against his thick Canadian skull. You see, Jimmy isn't political. And in a recent interview said, I don't really even care that much about politics. I gotta be honest. I love pop culture more than I love politics. I'm just not, I'm just not that brain. First of all, beyond the fact you're saying you don't care about politics is the most rich white guy privileged bullshit you can say. The bigger problem is you are so obviously political because all of pop culture is now political. You had Trump on your show and you normalized him by tussling with his hair. If you're not political, then why would you have someone running for president on your show? You can't have the Donald on and joke around with them and then say you want nothing to do with politics. Did you have him on because you love pop culture? Well, guess what? Everything in pop culture is political. And let's not forget, you're the biggest sin of all, Jimmy Fallon. You're just not funny. And that's why you, Jimmy Fallon, or this week's enemy of the podcast, go fuck yourself. You shouldn't even be the host of The Tonight Show. That job should belong to Conan (laughs) O'Brien. So... I don't know. Maybe you're a big Jimmy Fallon fan. I don't know. Oh, he's my favorite. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, he could be. And I, I don't know. I, I just, it doesn't work for me. I, oh. I've never found him that funny. Uh, even in SNL, like his like, he, aw shucks, I'm going to break in the scene kind of thing never quite worked for me. Yeah, he would always break in a way that wasn't connected to how funny the scene was, which is uncomfortable. And a big <laughs> issue. Except for in the cowboy sketch, cowbell sketch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Every, when everyone's breaking. Everyone that was different. Yeah. <laughs> um, the um uh the, the one of the issues I do have with his show beyond this whole political thing that reminded me of why I'm not watching him. He, one of the issues I do have is that he like playing beer pong isn't like a, a great joke. It's just they're playing beer pong. Like it's like, oh Betty White's playing beer pong. What is going on? Sorry. Two solo home runs in a row. Well, there you go. Fuck. Whoa. Yeah, sorry. I'll stay focused. (laughs) Um, So, I don't know. Do you watch a lot of late night talk shows? Uh, I kind of, I try to watch monologues periodically because of joke writing and stuff. Um, I watch Seth Meyers more than anybody else. Yeah, it's a why I find that I I end up watching Seth Meyers, but on YouTube. Yeah, like the next I day. just yeah, watch, watch it the next his day. a closer look. Yeah, mm-hmm. to be honest, that's all I'm really watching. With yeah, him. I watch the opening monologue jokes um, for writing reasons, but I like his his joke writing style, his staff style. It, it's funny. I I do watch Conan the yeah. most. Uh-huh. Uh, like I watch Conan <laughs> almost every night if I'm in going yeah. to bed. Like as I, I watch Conan, and he doesn't get all that political. No, he's never has been political. No, but he's also not having. Uh, Inviting Donald Trump on his show. I mean, he makes fun of Donald Trump a lot on his show. But, but that, that's part of the not? job. Yeah. Low hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even Fallon does that, but it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a muted. Yeah, it's yeah. a muted joke. It's, it's not, like, hey, it's, well, we can all agree that this is ridiculous, even if you like it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not what like Kimmel and Colbert are doing, where they're coming out. Like Kimmel comes out and like cries in his monologues <laughs> about like don't shame political him. issues. But no, no, I think that's great. <laughs> I find that much more preferable because I think we're living in a time where if you're not taking a stand, what what are you doing? Yeah, I find it very heartening that the, that the uh, um, hosts that are speaking up are speaking up. I actually was surprisingly really impressed with Fallon's um, after Charlottesville. I thought he he came out and said something that was like more muted than I think things that some other people said. But he said, like, it's if you're white, it's your responsibility not to be silent about this. And he said some stuff where it was like, I appreciate that as someone who has probably the widest draw to the entire country, you know, at least getting a couple of those things in there that needed to be said was like, good. It's kind of a... It's kind of that thing of like, 
I think about this a lot lately. Where like all in the family was able to make so, but by make these tiny, you know, steps toward changing people's minds about things. And right. even though they were they were fenced in in such a, a, a they couldn't go too far with it the way the way our shows can now. Like everyone would see it and would talk about it around the water cooler, like we were talking about earlier. And like that that anything where the needle gets to move just a little bit or a message gets to reach people who maybe don't who if he was political would turn off the show. Do you uh, think that even just a little bit that he does could be effective? Probably for not. That watch Jimmy Fallon. I don't. I don't think. I mean, I'm not. I'm. The, I'm not even agreeing with. I, I'm not a big. I'm not a big fan, and I'm not agreeing with uh, with his approach. And I don't think he's trying to make a difference by doing what he's doing. Just, I think that it is. Um, it is worth noting that if he became political, also people who don't want to hear it would probably just turn off, and they're probably right. turning off the other shows. Let me ask you this though: Could he, you know, by by is he necessarily being political by having? And I'm playing devil's advocate here. Could he just view this truly as like, okay, well, Donald Trump is someone that is popular in the culture. Yes, because he's running for president, but also because he was the host of The Apprentice. And we always have on the Tonight Show, even with Jay Leno, who was never like overtly political. I think I think he does view it that way. Yeah. And I think he's kidding himself. I think yeah. he's not understanding the reality of... But it's not just him. He's got producers. It's a whole team. It's a machine. It's not just Jimmy Fallon, like, in a room, like, you know... But if Fallon said, I don't want to talk to this guy, then not, he's not going to get on yeah, the other, show. Yeah, other hosts have specifically been like, you are not invited on my show. Um, I, uh... You know, this is just another example, though, in fairness to Fallon, how Trump has literally ruined everything. <laughs> like, how he has gone... He's ruined football. He's ruined late-night talk he's shows. He's ruined benign jokes. Yeah, I mean, everything... You know, I, I, I tweeted this today, and I, I was in the break room, and CNN was on, and someone's like, oh, what is this new story? It was some new story that I didn't know. Nobody in the room knew, and the guy goes, oh, it's probably some fake news. And I didn't know whether he was being uh, 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 sarcastic or not. Like, I couldn't tell. And anything to report on CNN is fake news. Well, you know that. They just make it up. They got writers. It's very <laughs> frustrating. I don't know when people are being sarcastic anymore. Yeah, I because don't... we've all decided it's okay to make like mock this thing, which just kind of gives it more power on some Yeah, level. I don't like the whole... I don't like making the fake news joke because... I think the fake news thing is so dangerous. Uh, like just, that, I'm just waiting for fake Jews. Um, That's the next one coming down the oof. mic. <laughs> I want to. We've kind of talked about how some of these guys, and I wanted to real fast. I know we're running a little long. Uh, Saturday Night Live. Uh, Taron uh, Killam or whatever did an interview recently where he talked about like how horrible it was that they had Donald Trump on. Um, yeah, and, they're just as guilty. You all, know, I would agree. Yeah. Oh, I, I think. Okay, they... but I, I think they know they're guilty and unlike Fallon they've they're not pretending not to be political and they've gone 180 degrees the other way I feel like they're trying to atone ah, but they've always been political like that yes so it seems like their choice to do it was already inherently political because they've always been political it's not like they never thought he would come close to winning. Well, that was no one and did. That's the problem. Neither did Trump when he agreed to be on <laughs> That's SNL. That's the problem. When we, we were doing an episode of the podcast and we were talking about future SNL hosts and we talk about that a lot like who like who do we think should host like this season <laughs> um, and I remember in that episode yeah. I said Donald Trump will host this season and I expected it to be like in May after he lost the nomination but uh. <laughs> but then, then that November, I was that? not surprised do you remember even way before that um, I said that I think Barack Obama one of the things he's going to do after his presidency is host SNL would he please That'd he can't great. now but if Hillary had won, yeah. I would say there's more than a 50% chance that Barack Obama would have hosted SNL. Not right away, but maybe after a year well, or two. Yeah, you yeah, can't under this Trump true, presidency because yeah. he can't go on there and be, uh, no. you know, in some skit Failing president, Obama. Barack Obama, unfunny, on to you. He's done such a good job of Ooh. not saying anything. <laughs> oh, it must be killing him. Since he I'm convinced that him office. and, like, the George Bushes and Carter... And the other one, Clinton, have a like Slack channel where they're just like all day long just chatting with <laughs> each other on their phones. So funny how much I like George W. Bush now. Yeah. Uh, so slow. Uh, I know, I know. But George W. Bush would never have I mean wouldn't obviously wouldn't be doing He's a fun war stuff. criminal. He's basically yeah. He, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, he started a pointless. It was just war, that you could, Yeah, it was just that you could count on him on the day to day to like sort of act like a human. That was well, that, the that's difference. the thing. Like I will say this, for all his 
fault George W. Bush, I think, cared about American human beings, soldiers. He wouldn't be insulting them. He wouldn't be, he he was, he wasn't, he wouldn't be trying to deport all these people. Nah. Like, nah. you know, he had some compassion. He, where Donald Trump has zero. <laughs> like, there's none. There's, like, there's negative compassion. Even my mother has made offhanded jokes about maybe they'll just kill him. Like, <laughs> like, like, because it, it's easy not to care about him because he's so nothing. He's so nice. He has nothing. He has no caring. He's not human. And these are the kind of opinions you're going to get on the Wolshot podcast. <laughs> so, um... Hot takes. Yeah. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of shit, I always like to end on a weird note. Uh, this story is already a little old, but uh, we had to talk about it. I think this happened while I was in London. Uh, a Colorado Springs woman has been taking big craps in front of someone's house for a few weeks now. They're calling her the mad pooper and she won't stop pooping. The cops are involved. Uh, they say, it's abnormal. It's not something I've seen in my career. For someone to repeatedly do such a thing, it's uncharted territory for me. This is the detective, I guess, on the case. Uh, there's plenty of public restrooms less than a block away from where she's targeting. This is intentional. Yeah, I think when you shit in front of someone's house, <laughs> it's intentional. Uh, the woman's also been citing pooping in a wall and uh, pooping in a Walgreens and nearby backyards. The presence of bathrooms close by and her proximity to repeat turds clearly shows she doesn't care about signs, and warnings, or completing the rest of her runs with mud butt. <laughs> Um, I want to think that she's doing this on purpose to cheer us all up right now. Yeah, the mad pooper is the hero we need in these dark times. Yeah. <laughs> Can I also point out the name of the detective? It's Sergeant Sharketty. That's Sharketty. Oh. Sharketty. That's who you want. Sharketty. Jonathan Sharketty. He's going to crack this case wide open. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> He's gonna get to the bottom of the mad pooper. You know how this story <laughs> is. Like a year from now, that she gets like shot down in a hail of gunfire. <laughs> what if this is like a suicide by police sort of situation? Aww. She's waiting for them to catch her. George Carlin has a joke. He goes, "Things you never want to see: a man taking a shit while running at full speed." <laughs> oh Jesus! <laughs> so there, I let you get that out of your head. Um, this woman, I don't know. Maybe she's not so bad. She's she's fertilizing. I, you know... And how much poop do you have to... I mean, this is... She's doing it repeatedly in a short period of time. Like, is she conserving? Is this like that kid you knew growing up that could just fart or burp repeatedly on command? Like, where is all that oxygen coming from? It's impressive. What is she eating beforehand? Like... Ugh. I'm saying if I matched on Tinder with a woman and we went on a few <laughs> dates and then I found out she was the mad pooper, I don't think it would be a deal breaker and that probably says a lot more about me than it does about her. Well, this would be the first time a woman shit in your sink. A woman tried to pee in my sink (laughs) but I lifted her off in time and put her on the toilet. (laughs) Um, It's really opening a can of worms right here. I made some high quality (laughs) relationships. Um, And on that note, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, Julie, one more time, tell the people where they can find you. Oh, on Twitter at jpairs. And uh, myadequatelifestyle.com. Excellent. Sean. You can find me on all forms of social media at the Sean David. So follow me there. You can follow me on Twitter at the Real Will Link. Um, I have no upcoming shows. I gotta start booking some shows. Get on it. I gotta start. I'm also Holiday su- stuff's coming up. I'm also supposed to start doing a second podcast, and I really have delayed this because I have to figure out how to do it. I've done a podcast for five years and I have no idea the tech I have don't possess the technical know-how to actually do one on my own I'm supposed to start this new podcast we'll figure it out we'll get it started my life has been very busy right now there's apology well, on all those tinder dates I've gone on a lot of tinder dates and I've prioritized the potential of having sex that leads to a meaningful relationship over rehashing a television show you've seen twice. Exactly. It's like a bad choice, honestly. Um, <laughs> this is a false choice that you're creating in your head. Um, but at this, either way, within the next few months, there will be a new podcast that I'll be part of uh, with the great Megan Salinas. 
And, um, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll get my book published and then you could read it. Sounds good. I'm working and on that. Next week we have on return we- guest. Return guest. Ian Alda's back. Yep. Uh, he is in or has been or was recently in a, uh, a, a, a play downtown LA, but he's also directed a web series called The Michaels about a married couple both named Michael. And uh, the hilarity that it ensues therein. Ian Alda, we're looking forward to having him back on. He's a good man. Good man. Uh, comes from a strong family. Good man. And on that note, Julie, thank you so much for being on this show. <laughs> thank you for solving sexism, racism, politics, all of it with us. We did it. Woohoo! Yay. Ever the Wish on Podcast, I'm Sean David. I'm Will Link. And we're finished. We're finished.